Welcome to the Bayshore Podcast. As listeners each week, whether through iTunes or through the church app, you're part of our church family. We would love for you to share stories of how Bayshore is impacting your life by sending us an email at amen at bayshorecc.org. As always, you can find all kinds of information and content on our website, bayshorecc.org. There's also our church app, which you could download by going to bayshorecc.org slash app. So thanks again for joining us this week, and we hope that today's message is a blessing to you. Well, good morning, everybody. What a great day, and it's so good to see everybody here at Bayshore Millsboro. We want to welcome our Fenwick Island campus. Let's all give our Fenwick Island campus a big hand right now. I know you guys are doing great. It's good to, good to see everybody. We have a wonderful group here this morning in Fenwick Island, a great group. And uh, we have a campus in, in uh, Rehoboth, so really, really awesome things are happening here at Bayshore. We are uh, talking uh, in this series about uh, how to have the best year you've ever had. This is 2020, 20 years from Y2K. It's hard to believe that it's been 20 years since the year 2000. Uh, but here we are in a brand new decade. We're starting a new decade. And I'm really excited about 2020. I believe that this year is going to be the best year I've ever had. It's going to be the best year I've ever had personally. I believe it's going to be the best year we've ever had as a church. And I'm just really excited about 2020. So we're talking about in this series, how can we have the best year we've ever had? Last week, we talked about the importance of making sure that we understand that the, our year, the quality of our year is not dependent upon what happens around us, but the attitude inside of us. We talked about Paul said, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord always. So I've just really discovering this incredible, powerful principle of, of rejoicing in the Lord, even when things are challenging. But here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that when you rejoice in the Lord, and you just uh, are glad and you rejoice in the Lord, even in the midst of challenging things, it makes you feel better. It makes you feel better. It sets your mind in a positive way of thinking. So I'm really excited about uh, living that out this year, rejoicing in the Lord, and just uh, honoring the Lord. So today we're going to look at the second principle of how we can have the best year we've ever had. And this is a principle that I think is probably the most important principle for us to have a great year. And that is the principle of making Jesus first in your life, making Jesus first in your life. Because what we, what we do at the beginning of most years is we are always thinking about how can we uh, uh, achieve certain goals. I know this year I have a goal to watch less TV and read more in the evening. Uh, and so I still watch TV and like certain things that I watch on TV. But this year I want to I wanna read more and l- watch less TV in the evening. And uh, that always helps me not to snack as much when I watch TV. I always snack too much. And uh, how many like to snack when you're watching TV? Is that your thing? So if I don't watch TV, I'm not going to eat that moon pie, you know. But if I got the TV on, more than likely, I'm going to go over and eat that moon pie uh, or those cookies or whatever. So, But this year, in order to have our best year ever, the main thing we can do is to make Jesus first in our life, to make Jesus first in our life. Now, when I think about that, I know that that's something that churches say all the time when you come to church. You know, we say things like, make Jesus Lord of your life, uh, or, you know, surrender your life to the Lord. That's the kind of language we, le- we use. But when I think about what that really means, what that really means is, uh, do I love Jesus more than I love everything else in this world? Do I love Jesus more then I love everything else in this world. So that's what it means in my mind uh, in order for us to make Jesus first in our life. It means that we love Jesus more than anything else in our, in our life. And that's a big challenge because there's a lot of things that want to tug at our heart, a lot of things that are really uh, important to us. But in order to be a disciple of Jesus, according to the New Testament, it means that Jesus is the first thing. He's the priority. and He's what I would call our primary love our primary love. We all have a primary love in life, and that's something that we love more than anything else, our primary love. And so I believe that the New Testament teaches that Jesus is to be our primary love. He's to be the most important thing in our life. And uh, we find that throughout the uh, Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have this, uh, what's called the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is something that the Jewish people would say, in fact, they still do this, This is the prayer they have in the morning 
in the prayer they have in the evening. It's one of the few prayers in the Old Testament that the Jewish people are called upon to pray every day. And it's found in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and it's called the Shema. And the Shema, it's called the Shema because the first phrase, Hear, O Israel, is the Hebrew word Shema. And here's what it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Now, I want us to repeat that together in this campus, in the Fenwick Island campus right now. Uh, just repeat after me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, I'm just going to make you a guaranteed promise this morning. If you make Jesus your passion, your primary passion this year, it will literally revolutionize your life. It will revolutionize your life. If people at Bayshore here in this campus, the Femme College campus, if we make Jesus the first thing in our life this year, it will electrify our campuses because we put Jesus front and center ahead of everything else. Jesus uh, articulated and affirmed what the Israelites said when they said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. When Jesus was asked which was the greatest commandment, he went back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and he says, Jesus said, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the Lord our God, with all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. So when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he, was, he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. Now when I'm thinking about this, I think that what we need to remember is that we are called to love many things. Now, Jesus doesn't uh, expect us to love just one thing. We love a lot of things in life. And uh, let me read to you a passage that points this out. John chapter 21, verse 15 through 17. This is a, uh, one of those resurrection appearances of Jesus after he was resurrected in John. I think there's like three resurrection appearances. And this is when he appears to the, some of the disciples. There's about seven disciples there. And he appears primarily to Peter. And uh, it says in uh, chapter 21 of John 21, uh, verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Now, what's he mean that uh, do you love me more than these? What does that mean? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, in this situation, the story, you know, Simon Peter, he's maybe a little discouraged. He's denied the Lord, and he's at this place where he's trying to, you know, kind of put his head back together. And so he says he's going to go fishing. He's been fishing all night, didn't catch anything. And in the morning, Jesus is on the shore, and there's that appearance. And then Jesus, after they had breakfast, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? And I've always wondered, maybe you've wondered, what are the these that he's talking about? Now, it could be scholars think, well, maybe he's talking about the fish that are on the, the coals there that are cooking because Peter's been a fisherman. And maybe Peter's thinking about going back to his old life as a, of, as a fisherman and giving up being an apostle. Maybe that's what he's thinking about. And Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me more than your vocation? Do you love me more than these fish? Maybe he's pointing to the fishing boat and the nets on the shore. Do you love me more than these? Maybe he's pointing to the other disciples, his best friends, his buddies. Do you love me more than these? And some scholars believe that he's uh, asking, Peter, do you love me more than these disciples? You said you love me more than anything. Do you love me more than these disciples? But the fact is, Jesus asked him, do you love me more than these? Now, I don't know what you love in your life. But there are some things that I love in my life. I love I've, I've certain things I love. For number, number one, I love coffee. I love good coffee. And I'm a big coffee fan. I drink coffee every day. I had coffee this morning. It was all ready. I love good dark roast coffee. 
I love Starbucks. I'm a big Starbucks fan, and my uh, staff got me for Christmas, uh, the Fruscios and the staff got me a Starbucks umbrella, uh, and I'm really, I just love Starbucks, and I take some heat for that sometimes. Starbucks has been noted as a liberal company sometime, and uh, I remember a couple years ago when they took their snowflakes off their uh, Christmas cups, everybody was in uproar that Starbucks was disting themselves from Christmas, and people said, are you going to still drink Starbucks coffee. And my response was, I would drink Starbucks coffee if they put 666 on the cup. That's what I said to them. Because I love Starbucks coffee. And I just love it. I love it. I've got a t-shirt that says, don't get between me and my coffee. I love coffee. And uh, that's one of the things I love. Uh, you know, another thing I love, I love, uh, I love good cookies. How many people love cookies? Anybody out there love cookies besides me? I love amazing cookies. I mean good cookies. And the best people that have the best cookies, I think, are Panera Bread. Panera Bread has the best cookies. I was preaching down to the Rehoboth campus uh, sometime last year and got done preaching. I did pretty good, so I said, I'm going to reward myself. So I went to uh, Panera. I had a free gift card for a free coffee there. So I got a, a, you know, it's not as good as Starbucks, but it's coffee, and I put a lot of half and half in it to, you know, to kind of help them along with their coffee challenge. And so uh, I was sitting there, and I ordered a cookie. Now, Panera has this, what's called a, uh, a kitchen sink cookie. And it's about the size of a small pancake, and it's real thick. So uh, it's, got, uh, it's got chocolate chips in it. It's got nuts in it. It's got a whole bunch of stuff in it. So I sat there with my hot coffee with a half and half in it, and I ate that cookie about the size of a pancake, and it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. I happened to be in uh, Panera a couple days later uh, for lunch with some people, and I happened to notice the little tag of how many calories were in that one cookie. There were 850 calories in that one cookie. And I hear, I'm here to tell you, it was worth every bite. It was worth every bite. So I love cookies, and uh, I, love, I love tennis. Those of you that know I love tennis, I love tennis. I went to uh, my daughter-in-law, Stacy. of course, our, uh, they, they, her and Joel and the kids are living with us right now as they're building a the house. And I went to Stacy yesterday. I said, Stacy, are you excited about next weekend? And she said, what, what? I said, aren't you excited about next weekend? She said, I don't know what's happening next weekend. I said, well, next weekend, the Australian Open starts. And it's the number, it's the first major tennis tournament in the, in, in the year. And I was, oh, I was just kidding her, and I was so excited about it. But I love tennis. I play tennis about four mornings a week. Some of my best friends are my tennis friends. And I play tennis. And you say, you play that much tennis, you must be really good. I'm not really that good. But I love to play, and I love the game, and I love to watch it, and I love to play it, and I love tennis. I love other things, but I really, really love tennis. I also, I love my Tacoma pickup, my Tacoma pickup. How many pickup drivers are here in the Millsburg campus? And raise your hand if you're a pickup driver. How about the Fenwick Island campus if you're a pickup driver? Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. So maybe not as many as Fenwick Island. I don't know. I'm just guessing there. But uh, anyhow, I love my Tacoma pickup. And I believe that uh, if Jesus were on this earth today, he'd be driving a Tacoma pickup. That's what I believe. <laughs> I don't have any uh, data for that, but that's what I believe. So, you know, I just love my pickup. Yesterday, it was such a warm day, such a beautiful day. Uh, after I got done my work in the morning, I waxed my truck, I detailed my truck, and uh, it's the best looking truck in the parking lot right now. It's amazing. So I love my pickup. And I love my wife, Karen. You say you finally got around your wife. That's good. <laughs> Talk about cookies, coffee, and tennis, and you finally got to Karen. Well, Karen's in a whole different category of love. You know, you know, love is in different categories. And I love my pickup, but I love Karen in a whole different category. And I love her. She's, uh, I remember the first night I took her out and I invited her out. I drove to her house. I was driving a 1971 American-made gremlin, if that tells you a little bit about my upbringing. And, uh, and I went to the, the door and she had curlers in her hair when she came to the door because she didn't think it was a real date. And uh, so, you know, I fell in love with her, and we've been married for 42 years. And of all the people, I, I agree with what James Dobson said. James Dobson said, if I have one hour left on this planet to live, I would want to spend that one hour with my wife. 
And I love Karen. I just love her. Uh, we go out every, uh, every Friday night. We go out on a date. And actually, it's a whole date day. And I actually, I have a little uh, container over there where I put all the movie tickets and all the concert tickets. Every time we go out, I put in this little container. And I, I make a mem mem memento of every date that we have. Because my thinking is one day we're going to be too, too old to drive and we're going to be sitting around, you know, like this. And we're going to get those things. I'm going to talk about all our dates one day. Because I love her more than anything. And she's the most amazing thing. I love my grandkids. I love my kids. I didn't mention my grandkids before my kids, you know. So you know how that is. You know, God gives you grandkids to reward you for not killing your kids when they were growing up. So... But I love my kids, I love my grandkids, I love my daughter-in-laws, I love my dad, I love my dad, and a whole different category of love. You know, so, so, you know, we can love. The Bible doesn't say, Jesus didn't say, Peter, do you love me instead of these? He said, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Because we are supposed to have multiple loves, things we love in life. Things that we enjoy in life. The Bible says in 1 Timothy that God has given us everything richly to enjoy. God wants to bless us and God is blessing us. In 2020, there are many blessings in your life right now. Many things that God is blessing you with right now. He's given us many things to enjoy. He's blessed us with many things. And so we, we, he doesn't say, Peter, do you love me instead of these? He said, Peter, do you love me more than these? And that's the issue. The issue is, do we love Jesus more than anything else in our life? And that's a really, really big challenge. We're to love Jesus more than anything in our life. Sometimes we get things mixed up. Sometimes we love certain things more than we should. And certain things that we should love more, we love them less than we should. And I even, I know one time Karen and I went to the movies and and I messed up. I didn't love her like I should have. I didn't honor her like I should have. We were, we was like way back years ago, we were watching this movie uh, starring Hilary Swank, uh, uh, Million Dollar Baby. Anybody remember that movie, Million Dollar Baby? Uh, it was a movie where Hilary Swank played, uh, she was a female boxer and, uh, and Clint Eastwood was her coach. And we were watching that movie and we went to a matinee and I just bought some Starbucks coffee I had a fresh cup of Starbucks coffee, and we were sitting at the top as a matinee. Uh, all our people were there. All the older people were all at the matinee. And I'm holding my coffee there, and we're watching this movie. We're sitting at the top. Karen's sitting next to me. We held hands a little bit, and I'm drinking coffee, and I'm just having time of my life. It's a great movie. And there's a scene in the movie where Hilary Swank is in a boxing match, and her nose gets broken. And uh, I mean, it really gets broken. And she's sitting at this, in this chair, uh, this little stool there in the corner and uh, Clint Eastwood, who's our coach, he's trying to set her nose. And Karen grabs my hand. She says, I think I'm gonna faint. I said, honey, it's a movie. We're good. We're gonna be okay. Well, sure enough, Karen fainted. She went down like a redwood tree. She went down <laughs> and her leg kicked my coffee and my, <laughs> And the, some of the Starbucks coffee came out of the top. And I'm trying to help her up by trying to <laughs> protect the coffee, you know, and pull her up. And I finally got her up, you know, and uh, I'm trying to walk her down the aisle to get out of there. And she says, are you still watching the movie? Are you still watching the movie? <laughs> well, that's a situation where things are out of order, you know. So say this with me. We are supposed to love many things but we're supposed to love Jesus more than anything so in order to have our best year ever we need to love Jesus more than anything we need to put him first in our heart again we need to make him first in our life again we may have been a Christian for 20 years 25 years 30 years 40 years we need to make Jesus our primary love this year if we make him our primary love, we'll have the best year we've ever had. Because sometimes we can get it all messed up about who is first in our life. Uh, a couple months ago, back in November of 2019, uh, Brian Moss, my friend who pastors Oak Ridge uh, Baptist Church in Salisbury, he and I are good friends. 
and uh, I just love Brian, love what they're doing. And uh, Brian contacted me, said, Danny, would you come and speak to the pastors in Salisbury uh, at a pastor's appreciation luncheon? I said, oh, yeah, I'll be glad to. And uh, just to get to hang out with Brian a little bit. So I, w I immediately agreed to do that. And I began to think about, and I think he asked me in September, or maybe before that even. And I began to think about, what do you want me to talk about, Lord? Why don't you talk about all these pastors? Because pastors, you know, we know everything. And I know I had a bunch of pastors there with their arms folded. And I was thinking about what should I talk about. And the Lord said, I want you to talk to them about them loving me. Do they love me? I thought, Lord, these are pastors. They have theological degrees. They've been to seminary. And he said, I want you to talk to them about loving me. And I want you to ask them if they love me more than they love their ministries. I said, wow, man, I was just hoping to go and do a little speaking thing and hang out. I didn't know I was going like, to have to get into something that nitty gritty. And I told them about something that happened to me. That in 2019, I went to uh, Tyler, Texas to speak. I went down to speak for my good friend, Sammy Fisher, in Tyler, Texas. He usually comes, uh, he has me come down and speak for him a couple times a year. And I went down. Sammy was my high school buddy. I led him to the Lord when we were freshmen in high school. And I just... Uh, you know, had a great time, uh, and Sammy and I have been best friends ever since high school. I led him to the Lord uh, when we were freshmen in high school, and then he went to seminary like I did, got all his training, and then his first assignment, he went to the Bahamas, and he was in the Bahamas for seven years, and the Lord sent me to Gumboro. So anyhow, I did ask the Lord <laughs> about that. I led him to the Lord. Maybe I should be in the Bahamas, you know, whatever, but I'm, this, is, this is Bahamas to me. I love Gumboro, anyhow. So we were down there, I was down there with Sammy for four days and we were uh, eating and going around to fine restaurants and he was driving me around to tennis matches. I had some tennis matches down there when I was there and we just had the best time. We're talking about churches, we're talking about leadership, we're talking about uh, leadership books that we're reading and we're talking about all the church business and all the stuff that we do in church and how to do church better and how to get our churches to grow and talking about that and for four days... We talked about church, and we talked about church leadership, and we talked about leadership books, and we talked about different ministers. And I got home, and it occurred to me that we didn't talk about Jesus at all. And I said to those pastors in Salisbury at Oak Ridge, I said, loving ministry and loving Jesus are two different things. Because you can love ministry and not really love Jesus. Ministry is so exciting. It's so dynamic. It's so incredibly, uh, you know, just really, uh, just get your juices going. There's so many challenges. But loving ministry is not the same as loving Jesus. And it's possible, I said to those pastors, it's possible, it's possible to love ministry more than you love Jesus. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? And I told him about the Taj Mahal. Remember the Taj Mahal? Here's a picture of the Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal uh, is a, uh, it's in India, of course. Anybody here ever been and seen the Taj Mahal? Anybody here? I have nobody here. I would love to see it. It was built in the 1600s uh, by Shah Jahan. And Shah Jahan was the, uh, was the, uh, you know, the prince of, of India then. And his, his favorite wife died, giving birth to their 14th child. And he loved this woman so much that he decided to build an edifice, edifice in her honor. And so what he did was he put her coffin in the middle of a big parcel of field and began to build the Taj Mahal around it. Took him 22 years and 20,000 people working on it. But he built it in honor of his wife. And in the middle of the construction, he's all caught up in the construction. And one day, he's uh, running across the construction site and he bumps into this box and bruises his leg and he's just really angry and he brushes off his leg and he says to the construction workers, throw this box out. And he had ordered throwing out the coffin that contained his wife that the monument was being built for. And I said to those pastors, are we building a church? Are we excited about the church? Are we excited about Jesus? Say this way, we are called by God, called by God. to love Jesus 
more than anything. To love Jesus more than anything. So what is, what is what are your these? I told those pastors about the uh, Mona Lisa. I said, you know, the Mona Lisa, here's a picture of the Mona Lisa. I said, the Mona Lisa, I said, people go all over the world, from all over the world to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa, and the Mona Lisa there. And I've never had anybody that told me they saw the Mona Lisa. Everybody says it's a little smaller than you would imagine it to be. I never, I've never had anybody go to the Louvre and go to Paris and see the Mona Lisa and say, say to, you know, hey, I want to take a picture with my smartphone. Is there any way you could take the picture out so I could just take a picture of the frame? And I said, when we make ministry more important than Jesus, we're focusing on the frame and not the picture itself. When you or I make our career more important than Jesus, we're focusing on the frame and not the picture. Now, Jesus said some challenging things about this. He said, you know, he said things that I think are a little tough. He said this, let's, let's Matthew 10, 27, let me read this to you. And you've heard this before, and this is really, really a tough scripture. Matthew 10, 37 through 39 says this, anyone who loves the fa their father or mother more than, everybody say more than. Everybody here in Millsboro and Femicola right now say more than. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Wow, that's really tough. Then Luke, Luke does this thing where he says, Anyone who comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such, as, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now that really, really bothers me. That language. But here, here's what you need to know about biblical language. The word hate in the, uh, in the New Testament, Old Testament, is a, in biblical idiom. The word hate means to love less. It means to love less. What that verse applies to is you've got a Muslim, Muslim person, and their father and mother says, if you become a Christian, we're going to disown you. And they submit to their parents instead of loving Jesus and committing to Christianity above that, then that's then that's not appropriate. And so when Jesus says, you have to love me more than anything, and, the, the, and I remember you know, the, what scholars say is when we use hate in this context, it's a hyperbole, hyperbole. How many know what a hyperbole is? I remember being a freshman in uh, University of Delaware, wondering what a hyperbole was. Anyhow, um, hy hyperbole is an overstatement. It's a statement to get your attention. But Jesus says you're to love your father and mother. You're not to love your father and mother more than me. And, and it can't mean that we're not supposed to love our parents because the Bible says we're supposed to honor our parents. And in fact, the Bible says we're supposed to uh, love our enemies. We're supposed to love our enemies. So certainly it doesn't mean that. But it means in comparison to our love for Jesus, it's in a whole different category. Just the way as much as I love coffee... I love Karen Moore, regardless of the movie illustration. I love Karen Moore. Uh, and w in our category of love for God, we love him more than anything. We love him more. He's supreme in our affections. Uh, the chief end of man, the Westminster Confession says, it, to enjoy God and love him forever. So we love God. And when we love the Lord and we make him first and we make him supreme in our life, we're setting ourselves up to have the best year we've ever had. Now, here's the thing about loving the Lord more than anything. I think that's a big challenge. Now, here's the reason we should do that. First of all, the reason we should do that is because when we love Jesus first, above everything else, we love Jesus more than our vocation, more than the fish that Peter was maybe Jesus referring to. We love Jesus more than our vocation, more than our hobby, more than our friends. We love Jesus first and we make him first in our life, it means that it fulfills us in such a way that we are better to everybody else. In fact, when Jesus is not first in your life, you're not at your best. But when Jesus is first in your life, you are at your best 
because you're filled with him, you're filled with the Spirit. I think in order to be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus has to be first in our life. And when Jesus is first in our life, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we have peace, love, joy. In fact, when we love Jesus first, we're able to love our spouse better than we could if he wasn't first. When we love Jesus first, we're able to be a better person in our career than if Jesus wasn't first and our vocation was first. Because loving Jesus first fills us up to such a degree that we can be better at everything. Say this with me. Loving Jesus makes me better at everything. So when you're first in your life or your vocation's first or your hobby's first, you're not at your best. And there's something missing in your life and you're not fulfilled and you're not satisfied, and there's something that's tragically missing. But when you make Jesus first of your life, he fills you with his peace, he fills you with his joy, he fills you with his love, he fills you with his mercy, so that you can be better at everything you do because he fills you up. This last week, my dad had a, a, a procedure on his heart, and I was with my dad all day on Wednesday, and uh, BB Hospital did the procedure, did a wonderful job taking care of my dad and had such a great experience there at the hospital. And uh, my dad had this little thing put in his heart to keep blood clots from going through his heart into his brain. And it was a very complicated surgery and we had been prepping him with different tests for this. And so my dad, you know, he's, uh, he's 82 years old. So we uh, got him ready for all that and I was with him early was he got ready to go into surgery and my sister Debbie was there and my other sister was there and so we were uh, helping my dad and when my dad kept talking about I can't wait to get out of surgery because I want some iced tea he my dad loves uh, McDonald's iced tea he's uh, he's like he's like I'm addicted to coffee he's addicted to tea he loves the McDonald's iced tea and I said uh, we're gonna get you some iced tea as soon as you get through this and they say you can have it and so dad got the recovery in the in the late afternoon and um, and so my sister Debbie snuck out and she got him this, I mean, this just gigantic thing of iced tea. And uh, he had, you know, his, he had some surgery on his heart and everything. And so, you know, there's some, some things involved and, and wires and everything. And we got this big cup. And I looked at the big cup and my dad, his eyes were big as fried eggs. You know, he wanted this, he wanted this tea really bad. And I said to Debbie, this is a bad idea. I said, we're going to try to tilt this big cup with a straw over my dad, and if that leg comes off, he's gonna be covered with iced tea, and that cannot be a good thing after heart surgery. I'm just telling you, I'm not a doctor, but I don't think that's a good thing. So we got a smaller cup, this little cup he'd been using with the, uh, uh, with the, you know, the, the hospital iced tea, which he says was deplorable. So, uh, so we emptied that out, and then I poured, I kept pouring in the, the, the iced tea from the McDonald's cup into the little uh, BB, cup and I put the straw in there and I kept leaning over to my dad and he was sucking that tea down and I would fill it back up he was sucking it down I mean I, he was just like tearing that tea up he was so excited I said dad I don't know if it's the tea or the sugar I don't know what you're after here but he loved it and you think about when you make Jesus first in your life he fills you up so you can minister better to other people he fills you up so you can be minister better to other people. That's why he says to make him first. Because if he's not first, we're not at our best. We can't be our best us until Jesus is first. Because we were created by God. We were made by God to make Jesus first, to make him Lord of our life, to make him the primary thing. And if we're not making Jesus the primary thing, we're not really living out the way we were created to be you were created for a lot of things you have gifts you have leadership you have all kinds of gifts but primarily you were created by God to love him and if you're not loving him and honoring him it's not that God is insecure God needs nothing God doesn't need your love he doesn't need your affirmation he doesn't need your praise he's not needy he doesn't go to Facebook to see how many people like him he's not like that God needs nothing he's all sufficient but you were created and I were created to honor and glorify the Lord and when we honor Honor him first he fills us up so we can be better to other people so say this with me we were made to love God 
with all our being. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? You and I were made to love God supremely, to love him with all of our heart. Now, if you go out on Route 1, those of you that are in Fenwick Island, and you go out on Route 1 uh, every morning, and there's a Cessna airplane that's idling down the highway, you're going trying to go from, uh, you know, coming out there by Harpoon Hannah's, and you're trying to go down Route 1 toward Rehoboth or Dewey. And there's a Cessna airplane every morning aisling down the highway. Here's a picture of a Cessna airplane that's going down the highway. And uh, if you got behind a Cessna airplane every morning it's aisling down the highway, what would you think? You would think there's something bad wrong here. Why is that airplane aisling on the highway? Because that airplane was not made to idle on the highway, but that airplane was made to soar. And you were not made to make your life about something of less value, like your job or your career or your position or your hobby. You were made to soar and to love God. And when we love the Lord with all of our heart, we are our best us and we're able to help other people because we're living out how we're created. Let me just close real quickly with uh, one of the reasons that we should love Jesus more than anything. There's a lot of reasons, and I've got a bunch of points here, but here's, a, here's another reason I think is real important as I kind of bring this to a close here. Everything that I love in life, coffee, my pickup, tennis, my wife, Karen, my grandkids, my kids, this church, I love this church. I love it. I wouldn't be anywhere else. I love this church. I love the Eastern Shore. I love the beach, and I love the chicken houses. I like the Eastern Shore. How many love the Eastern Shore? Would you say a big amen? How many would say I just love? Let's give the Lord. People are moving here, and this campus, Rehoboth campus, people come for everybody to live here because it's just a wonderful place to live. We love it. I love this church. I love everything about it. But everything I have that I love came from the Father. Everything I had came from him. You know, when you look at Karen and you see how beautiful she is and you see how wonderful and sweet she is, you know I didn't pull that off on my own. You know there's no way that I could have ever got a woman that good. How many know that? Just raise your hand. You know that. Do not raise your hand. That was not nice that you did that. <laughs> Jeremy, I hope they didn't raise their hand down there. I hope that. Everything I have came Everything I love came from the one that loves me. Say it with me. Everything I have that I love came from the one who loves me. So I was sitting in my chair uh, in my office, my home office the other day, and next to the table there's a, a book called 50 Years of U.S. Open History. And there's a picture. I think I have a picture of it. And uh, this book was, uh, maybe we don't have a picture of it. I thought we had a picture of it. Yeah, there it is. U.S. Open, 50 years of championship tennis, and it's a picture, picture story of the U.S. Open and all that. And I'm sitting there, and I'm drinking my coffee, and I'm studying. And I looked at that book. And I love that book. I read it when I'm on break, when I just need a break to read something fun. I pull it out and look at the pictures, and I read it. And I was looking at it. I got it for Christmas. And when I, when I looked at it this other day, when I was looking at it, what my heart went to was not the book. But my heart went to Joel, who got it for me, my son Joel. And Joel gives the most thoughtful gifts. He knows me. He knows what I like. And he always has a way of buying me things that I love. You know, when you give a gift card to a family member, what it really says is, I really didn't put a lot of thought on this, and I really don't care. But Joel, he always, he does, he does a wonderful job with that. And I thought about, I love this book. But as I looked at the book, I always remember that the book came from my son who thinks about what would bring me joy. So the reason I'm to love Jesus more than anything else is because the one that loves me 
has given me everything I love. Would you say it with me? The one who loves me has given me everything I love. Say it with me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Would you lift your hands, O Lord, now as Chiron plays this year? This is the most, the main thing. Keep the main thing, the main thing. This is the main thing. Making Jesus first in your life. Loving him more than anything else. It'll turn your life around. Maybe one time Jesus was first in your life. Jesus said to the church of the, uh, the Ephesians in Revelation chapter 2, you've lost your first love. Return to loving me first. So Lord God, as we begin a new year, we return to loving you first. Let's all lift our hands here in Millsboro and, and uh, Femic Island campus. Let's lift your hands and let's say this, Lord Jesus, I love you. I worship you. You are my primary love in 2020. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.